y'all, what's up? Welcome back to Roots and Refuge Farm. My name is Jess, and today I wanna to talk to you guys a little bit about saving seeds, and I wanna answer some frequently asked questions, maybe clear some things up this time of year. I start getting messages where people will say, hey, I read this thing, or someone told me this thing, and now I'm feeling really discouraged. Should I even uh, plan on saving seeds? Should I even bother? And I found that there's quite a bit of information pertaining to seed saving and cross-pollination and hybrids and heirlooms and all of that that's really um, kind of unclear and sometimes untrue. So today I just want to give you guys some information to help you as new gardeners or maybe seasoned gardeners that have just never forayed into saving seeds uh, because I think saving seeds open so many doors to sustainability, to uh, budget-friendly gardening, as well as just taking another step into like making your garden your own. Whenever you're able to save your own seeds, you're able to share them. There's so much beauty in that. I love seed saving and more than anything, I want it to be kind of demystified and <laughs> I want to give you permission to do it. So the first topic, if you've been here for very long at all, you've heard me talk about, and that is heirlooms, hybrids, and GMOs. Uh, it never fails. Year after year, um, I get asked literally thousands of times, where do I get non-GMO seeds? I want, or people say, I want to grow heirlooms because I want to be able to save seeds. I want sustainable seeds. There's just a lot of confusion about this. So the first thing that you need to know about GMOs, it is not legal for seed companies to sell GMOs, genetically modified organism seeds, GMO seeds, to home gardeners. So in order for a person to get their hands on GMO seeds, usually you're talking about a big agriculture farmer, they're having to sign contracts and all of that stuff. They're not walking in Lowe's. They're not ordering from a catalog that sells to home gardeners. That is not the situation with GMO seeds. Now, there is the possibility if you got some seeds from a person who saved seeds, let's say for corn, and they lived in commercial farmland and they lived near cornfields where GMO corn was grown, there is a potential at that point because of cross-pollination that you could accidentally get some GMO seeds. If you are going into any box store, any dollar store, any hardware store, any feed store, if you're going on any seed company online, uh, whether they are like number one heirloom seed company or just your basic uh, big national brand seed company, you're not buying GMO seeds on accident. So you don't have to worry about that. If you decide you wanna take a stand against GMOs, you primarily do that in the grocery store. And you know, if you wanna take a stand against GMOs, you can do that by growing a home garden and that'll keep you out of the grocery store from buying, buying uh, things that have GMO ingredients in them. So with GMOs kind of out of the conversation, whenever you're talking about seed sourcing, you're gonna come down to the options between heirlooms and hybrids. And um, heirlooms are varieties that have been around for many generations. Hybrids are just crosses. Whenever you're looking at hybrids, you'll have the option between F1, which means it's a first generation cross, which means that the parent plants of the, those seeds uh, were usually at that point hand crossed. F1 hybrid seeds are typically more expensive because they're more labor intensive to create because they have to be crossed by hand. The other option for hybrid is open pollinated and open pollinated just means that the that variety has been stabilized. It has been bred and the seeds have been saved over so many generations that it's no longer like a mixed bag of genetics. It's when you have a fruit and you take the seeds from it, it makes a plant like the parent plant. So all heirlooms are open pollinated. Stabilized hybrids are open pollinated. All heirlooms at one point before they had been kept the same and passed down for generations, they were hybrids because at some point that cross happened. Either uh, somebody a hundred years ago had two tomatoes in their garden that they kind of liked both of and they decided to mix the pollen together, or, you know, mix the pollen from one flower onto the flower of another plant and make a mix. Or it was a happy accident that happened in their garden and they thought, oh, this is neat. This is a new, new thing that's never showed up in my garden before. And they just saved the seeds over several seasons until 
it was stable. And then they kept it and they handed it down to their kid who handed it down to the neighbor who handed it down and down and down. And you get the idea. Eventually that hybrid became what we call an heirloom. Now, with that said, if you want to have consistent results out of your garden, meaning you really, really like a certain type of tomato. Here, actually, we'll use this as an example. This is an Italian heirloom, heirloom tomato. And if I really like the Italian heirloom tomato, which I do really like the Italian heirloom tomato, lovely, it's big, it's meaty, it's red, great for paste, great for slicing, makes huge tomatoes. And if I really, really like this tomato, um, I want to be able to save the seeds. And I want this particular tomato, I want to make sure I get this exact tomato in my garden next year, next year, next year. But I don't want to have to keep going back to the seed company and buying the same seeds. At that point, it's very important that you buy open pollinated seeds, whether they are recently developed hybrids or whether they are heirloom varieties like the Italian heirloom here that's been handed down for generations. Because I know I have the option of making sure that this plant does not cross pollinate. I have the option of saving those seeds and having the same result year after year. The misconception that comes up is people will get into like a prepper mindset and they're wanting to make sure that they have food sustainability and they're just thinking along the lines of in case of emergency, I've got to have the heirloom seeds so I can save seeds. And that's not true. You actually, in most cases, can grow seeds for most things. You could scoop the seeds out of the tomato from the grocery store, from the farmer's market that your neighbor gave you, that you grew in your garden next to a hundred different varieties, that you did nothing to keep the cross-pollination from happening. And if you grow the tomato seeds, you will in, in, I would, I would go as far as to say in all cases, there are probably some exceptions of some hybrids that if you try to grow them, that they don't produce. That is a very rare exception. In almost all cases, you're gonna get a tomato if you grow a tomato seed. Now the question will be, is it anything like the tomato that you took the seeds out of? That's where the open pollination comes from. The stability is saying, I know the product that I want, so I want to use the seeds that are absolutely gonna create that product. There are rumors that get thrown around all the time. Well, farmers spray something on their, their crops or spray something on their seeds to keep the seeds from growing. And honestly, I hate that rumor with a fiery passion. Like I hear that all the time, uh, all the time. Well, I wish I could grow seeds from that, but I know it's sprayed to keep it from growing. And I would say, again, most things will grow. Most things will grow. I have personally grown things from seeds from the store just to prove that you can. I have grown seeds from little containers of herbs like you buy like dill seeds. I have grown uh, seeds from fruit in the store, fruit from the farmer's market, and I get to hear lots and lots and lots of feedback from people from all over who say, oh yeah, I grow stuff from the grocery store all the time. I remember sitting at a restaurant with my aunt once and she scooped the tomato seeds out of the tomato on her salad and wrapped them up in a napkin and went home and grew them. So before you like deem in your mind that something is ungrowable, try it. Like try to grow it before you say that won't grow. Try to sprout it and see if it'll sprout. Sometimes when I think about that rumor, that whole things from the store won't grow thing, it makes me wonder like who started that and why didn't they want people to garden? <laughs> so the summation of all of that, I know I can get a little ranty when it comes to that because it it breaks my heart when people are talked out of gardening because I think gardening is the most natural thing in the world and I think that uh, we are so much more capable than we believe that we are and we have more resources than we realize. But the bottom line is you can grow any seeds and get something. If you want to have the most consistent result, buy open pollinated seeds, either heirlooms or hybrids, and grow those and then make steps to keep them from cross pollinating, you will continue to have the same result from your garden year after year. So that leads us into the next big misconception about growing a home garden and that is cross pollination. So I actually can speak to this misconception 
very confidently for, because for the first few years that I gardened, I didn't even try to save the seeds because whenever I looked online um, and said, you know, what do I do to keep varieties from cross pollinating? I read guidelines like they need to be 50 yards apart. They need to be 100 yards apart. Keep the different varieties 100 yards apart from one another in order to ensure no cross pollination. Well, I don't know about you, but I do not have the space to grow my varieties a football field length apart from each other. And here I was thinking, oh, I love varieties. I'm so excited. And I was looking at the seed catalogs and thinking, this is wonderful. This is beautiful. So of course I brought, I bought 20 varieties of tomatoes. And then I'm trying to figure out how many football fields that's going to take in order for me to be able to save seeds. And immediately I thought, oh, well, I guess I can't. And so I just didn't. I didn't even try. And that is, again, another devastating result of misinformation. When you read guidelines like that, what they're saying is to absolutely ensure that there will be no cross-pollination, you need to keep your plants this far apart because that's far enough that the pollen of one plant is not going to be carried on the wind or carried on the legs of an insect to the flowers of another plant. And that may be true. However, you really just need to understand how pollination works and it's not the same for all plants. For instance, beans self-pollinate and they so, so rarely cross, even if you have multiple varieties growing on the same trellis, they so rarely cross they, that you can save your bean seeds and get a true to type next generation plant almost every single time. I have never had a bean cross pollinate. Now I'm sure it happens. I'm sure there's probably some exception and there are new varieties of beans. And so I'm sure people are able to cross pollinate them. And so it must happen naturally, but it's so rare. I've never had it happen. And I've talked to many people who save seeds and most all of them tell me I don't do anything at all special to keep my beans from cross pollinating. And there are a lot of things like that, like lettuce, self-pollinates. Most brassicas do self-pollinate, which is kales and cabbages and broccolis. Most of those are self-pollinating. And what that means is that inside the blossoms of those plants, they have both parts. They have the pollen producing parts as well as the pollen receiving parts. And all it takes for those plants to pollinate is a slight breeze that comes and moves them and makes the pollen inside the blossom get to the place in the blossom that it's supposed to be. I know I'm oversimplifying that, but it doesn't have to be complicated. For the most part, you can save seeds from many, many things without any concern of cross-pollination. Now, when it comes to the kinds of plants that people are often growing in their garden, like tomatoes and peppers and eggplants, those actually are all self-pollinating as well. And all of those things that suggest that you plant them a football field away from one another with different varieties to keep cross-pollination from happening, they're giving that kind of advice because like, if you were gonna sell your seeds and you wanted to make sure without a shadow of a doubt that you were selling pure seed, you might wanna follow those kinds of guidelines. Like I know for instance, in the past, when I have visited Baker Creek, they'll put all of one variety of pepper in an enclosed high tunnel to make sure that there's no chance that any other pollen is making it into those peppers. So if you're trying to really go after pure seed, you can do the spacing thing, but that doesn't really work for me because I want to grow a lot of varieties and I have a, a space that I can't, I can't space things out that much. And I'm not willing to say, okay, I'll only grow one kind of tomato and one kind of pepper so that I can save the seeds. So I'm going to tell you what I do. And it is, for me, has been a total game changer. So I get these little bags, these little organza bags. I'll put a link to these in the description down below, but you can just search like mesh party favor bags. These are the same little things that you get like Jordan almonds in at a wedding. They've got a drawstring at the top. And this is, I believe this is the four by, eh, yeah, like four by six size. But these are what I use to keep cross pollination from happening in my garden when I want to have the same variety of tomato the next year and I'm trying to save seeds to achieve that. And all I do, and I've done this on tomatoes and peppers, cover the blossoms before they open with one of these bags. I just wiggle this down over the blossoms and pull the drawstring. 
just like this. Now, since those plants have everything that they need in those blossoms to pollinate, uh, once the blossoms open, I'll come and shake this and just gently shake the bag, maybe flick it a few times. Just make sure that I'm dislodging that pollen to get in. Once the blossoms are open and I know I've shaken them really good, I just wait until fruit begins to set. And when the fruit begins to set, then I can take this off because it's got fruit on it now. It cannot be pollinated by anything else. The fruit is already formed. It has all the genetics inside of it. And I take the bag off at that point because that fruit's going to get big. And I take something like a ribbon or a string and I tie it around the branch where that fruit is growing. And then I know when that fruit gets to be full size that the seeds in that fruit were absolutely pollinated by that same plant. So the seeds in that fruit Fruit will grow a true to type next generation and I pick those and I save out the seeds that I want to save and that takes all the guesswork out of worrying about football fields away I can grow 25 varieties in one row all next to each other and get true to type next generations by using these and this is just a barrier it's just keeping anything from bringing other pollen in and something like that is unnecessary with some varieties, things like lettuce and beans. You just don't need that. And while I'm giving you a basic overview now, I would encourage you to remember the questions to ask. I don't ever wanna just teach you what to think. I wanna teach you how to learn and how to be inquisitive and how to be a good student. So if you're ever confused and you're like, what do I do here? How do I know how this pollinates? How do I know? Just go on your phone. You probably have a phone in your pocket and go do an internet search and say, how do, Brussels sprouts pollinate? How do lettuce plants pollinate? And usually you'll have all the information that you need to figure out what you need to do to protect that plant from cross pollination and it'll pop right up uh, as soon as you do a search. Now there are some plants that don't self pollinate that you're going to be growing in your garden. Squashes and melons and cucumbers. These plants have male and female flowers and those plants are dependent on insects, pollinators, on uh, the wind. They're dependent on a person with a paintbrush, they're, they're dependent on some carrier delivering the pollen from one flower, from the male flower, to the unpollinated fruit of the female flower. So with those, you can't just cover the blossoms and wait uh, because by covering the female flower, you are essentially going to um, block the pollen that it needs from getting to it and it'll end up just drying up and falling off. However, what you can do is when you identify a female flower that is not yet open, you gotta be very watchful, but uh, you'll be able to tell because a female flower will have a little fruit behind it and it's be very small and immature. And as the flower bud begins to form before it's open, you wanna somehow, you wanna cover it. You can use a bag, you can use some something wrapped around it. You could tie the end of the flower uh, with a little piece of string very gently. And basically you just wanna keep that flower closed as the plant comes to the point of opening where it's saying I'm ready for pollen. Uh, you wanna make sure that nothing is able to get to that. And then you come in with a paintbrush, you find the male flower, you remove the pollen from the male flower, and then you take the you take the the bag off or the you untie it and you hand pollinate that female flower with the pollen. And then you cover it again to make sure that nobody else does the same, that no bee comes and brings pollen from another. And after that fruit begins to develop and the flowers start to dry off and, and fall off, you can then remove the cover just like with the tomatoes, just like with the other fruit and mark that fruit. And you know that you have a fruit that has pure seeds in it. That may feel a little bit overwhelming and that may not be like super beginner gardener stuff don't feel overwhelmed. So I want to tell you this, if you do nothing to keep cross pollination from happening, no barriers, no tying stuff, no brushing pollen from one flower to the other, you do absolutely nothing. You just come down to your garden every day and you pick fruit and eat it and you think, but I want to save some seeds. Do it. The worst that's going to happen is you'll get a hybrid. And for all you know, you might get a hybrid that's the best, the best okra or the best tomato or the best cucumber that you've ever had. The worst that's gonna happen is a hybrid. And to me, that is a very small risk. You're still gonna get food. 
you might get something interesting and you won't have to turn around and buy more seeds. If you want to do it sustainably, you can do it that way. So I've had some really cool hybrids happen in my garden. I've saved many seeds without bagging them. And because plants like tomatoes do self pollinate most of the time, even when I don't use a bag, I still get a, a true to type plant most of the time. I have gotten hybrids, that's how new varieties are created and I think it's kind of cool. The only time that I do this though is whenever I'm growing something that's like one of my favorites, especially something that may be rare that I can't go get the seeds somewhere else and I want to make sure that I keep seeds stocked for that. I'll do the bags then. But most of the time I save seeds pretty willy-nilly, I'm not that worried about it. New hybrids are cool to me. And I've gotten some really cool things out of my garden by just saving seeds without worrying about cross-pollination. I had this really cool okra that I've grown like multiple years now that was a mix between a burgundy okra and a green okra that ended up with these really cool streaks on it. I've had really neat cross-pollinated basils that ended up really splotchy looking with purple and green. I had this really awesome thing where an Armenian white cucumber, which is technically a melon, not a cucumber, mixed with this chrysanthemum melon and it ended up with these oblong kind of melony cucumbers that were really cool. So before you say, well, this is overwhelming and I don't understand enough about this, so I'm just not going to save seeds, I would say rather default this is kind of overwhelming and I don't really understand about this, so I'm just going to save seed recklessly and maybe end up with a cool hybrid that nobody's ever had before. Now there's one other rumor that comes up, and this isn't a rumor, this is actually seeded in some truth, which is that you should never save seeds from squash because they uh, can end up pro like developing toxic fruit. Some cross-pollinated squashes are toxic. and I actually did some research on this because this pops up every year during the summer in forums and it ends up causing all this drama and some people are really scared and we ended up digging into this and finding out that that is true, that sometimes squash will cross pollinate and create toxic fruit. But what is not often talked about is that that toxic fruit is very, very, very bitter. So if you were to ever like go to eat it, you would find out very quickly that it's not good. It is a rare thing to happen. Uh, and so the risk would be if you ended up with cross-pollinated squash that you gave garden space to something that turned out to be inedible, which would stink. But you don't have to be afraid that you're gonna accidentally kill your family with toxic squash because you recklessly save seeds. Uh, it's gonna taste so bad that nobody's gonna eat it. And I have grown squash that I've pulled the seeds out of stuff from farmer's markets and grocery stores and that I saved recklessly out of my own garden. And I have ended up with crosses before. And because squash so readily does cross pollinate, that's pretty common to end up with a cross but I've never ended up with anything that tasted like bad or was obviously an issue. Again, I think there are a lot of things that get circulated as big concerns and fearful concerns that sort of lead to that line of thinking of like, oh, leave food growing to the professionals. And I think in most cases, that's really just not the case. That's not something that you need to be fearful of. But if you wanna make sure that you get what you are uh, trying to get, just isolate the blossoms and hand pollinate them. It's not that hard to do. Another cross-pollination misconception that I hear uh, spoken about a lot is where people say, don't grow your sweet peppers right next to your hot peppers because your hot peppers will make your sweet peppers hot. The, the way that I think that rumor came about is that the genes, the genetics of hot peppers are dominant. So if a hot pepper were to cross pollinate with a sweet pepper, you could eat that sweet pepper and it would be sweet. Just like if a golden retriever were to impregnate a poodle. The poodle would not turn into a golden retriever. The poodle would still be a poodle, but the babies inside the poodle would have half the genetics of the golden retriever. So when a sweet pepper is growing and a hot pepper pollinates the flower of the sweet pepper, the sweet pepper still grows sweet peppers because it's still a sweet pepper. But the seeds inside that pepper may carry a mix of genetics. And if it did cross pollinate with a hot pepper, those genetics will be hot because hot pepper genetics are dominant. So you won't ruin your sweet peppers by growing them next to hot peppers, but if you're trying to save the seeds for them, and they are right next to hot peppers, obviously the likelihood of them pollinating from those hot peppers is higher if they're right by each other. 
And so the best way to keep that from happening is some sort of barrier. If you're wanting to protect those seeds from being cross-pollinated, get those blossoms covered before they open, and then make sure that you're getting some wind movement to them so that those blossoms can pollinate themselves. And then once the fruit is set, you can remove the bag, mark those, and save seeds from those fruits because you know that they were isolated. What I usually do when I'm saving seeds for peppers is I will plant all of my sweet peppers together in one bed and then all of my hot peppers together in another bed. Now they're not a football field away, but since they are self-pollinating plants, that greatly eliminates the likelihood of cross-pollination by just getting them away from each other. Because most likely, if they're going to pollinate with a plant other than themselves, it's going to be one of the ones that's right around it. Now, I know that's a lot of information, and I'm sure that I oversimplified something that somebody uh, probably is able to explain better than me. However, the main thing that I want to get across to you as a home gardener is that it's this is not rocket science. This is not something that requires a massive education in order to do. And if you are confused about something, like if you're growing something that you're, you're unsure of, you don't know how readily does this cross-pollinate with something else. Should I intervene with some method? All you have to do is search how does such and such plant pollinate and you'll get your answer. If it says that it's self-pollinating, in most cases you can probably save the seeds and get a true to type next generation plant. If it says that it needs pollination from an outside source, you might need to step in and intervene. If you want to 100% guarantee either way that you're going to get seeds that are pure because you want to have the same product year after year, then use some sort of barrier method to make sure that no other pollen, no outside pollen gets into that flower before you're able to make sure that it's pollinated the way that you want it to be done. Either way, I encourage you to save seeds, save them recklessly, save them all the time because the more seeds we have, the more we can share and the more people that we can help get back into the garden. Thank you guys for hanging out with me today. I bless you. Until next time.